Okay, so Lulazur, today we are here at a really wonderful uh, cave site just outside of Chongqing, the Dazu cave site. And um, so, how about you tell us a little bit about uh, what this cave is, and specifically, let's start off with when was it made? Okay, this cave, uh, the whole site uh, in this sort of horseshoe-shaped location, uh, most of these images are carved out of rock. Uh, it made in late 12th century, uh, mm -hmm. so in Chinese history it dated to Southern Song. Mm -hmm. um, it's entirely made by a local gentry, um, so he raised the funds, mm -hmm. um, and of course he has followers uh, who succeeded him uh, to complete the whole work. Mm -hmm. um, and this Buddhist cave is the largest uh, among all the Buddhist caves in the Sichuan area. But Sichuan area is particularly rich in Buddhist uh, uh, art and Buddhist culture. So this is not the only site you can see this kind of impressive ones, but this is the largest. Um, so this is over 800 years old, 850 that we're looking at right now. Absolutely. And arguably, uh, this is the best preserved caves among all uh, in, in um, Chinese cultural history. Wow. Uh, when we talk about caves, we usually think about the famous caves like Longmen yeah. or, or uh, Yungang uh, in northern China, mm -hmm. uh, which are dated to much earlier period to mm -hmm. medieval China. Mm -hmm. But this one is slightly later. Um, and the difference between this one and many other caves, uh, the earlier caves, uh, including the caves that dated to this period but not in this location, usually we call them dedicational caves. Mm -hmm. They are caves that basically commissioned by a wealthy and a powerful man, uh, a, a member of a society. So he commissioned, he spent money uh, and, and, and commissioned the, uh, uh, beautiful caves with images, uh, murals, so uh, he can receive blessings uh, from the Buddhist uh, deities, uh, from Buddha. But this one, uh, what we usually Buddhologists like to call Buddhist a theme park. Mm. Um, it is a site that intended to display the main local beliefs, but also the large beliefs of Buddhism in general, mm -hmm. and try to make pictorial representation of some of the most popular Buddhist beliefs. Mm. Um, so when people come to visit the pilgrims, they can have a general idea of what the Buddhism is all about mm. and why it matters to their life. Uh, so it, it, all these images are basically capture the daily lives at the time. Mm. Uh, so give people a sort of connections to their actual life. Wonderful. Another sort of unexpected example of getting slight snapshots of what life might have been like in the region exactly. 100 or plus years Absolutely. ago. Absolutely. Um, so we can draw a lot of, uh, sort of social history materials from this. Wonderful resource for historians as well. You mentioned, so this, this so-called Buddhist theme park is there to introduce viewers and visitors to some of the main themes of Buddhism. How about you introduce our students who aren't here with us now to a sort of a big picture view of Buddhism and how Buddhism existed here in Chengdu. Absolutely. Um, the Buddhism popular in China is generally called the Mahayana, okay. the Great Vehicle, um, which is a, a Buddhism originated probably in Northern India and Central Asia mm. uh, around the, the age of Common Era mm. and then quickly spread along the Silk Road uh, to the entire East Asia and later spread to places like Tibet, um, and Nepal, mm -hmm. um, and this Mahayana teaching emphasized on universal salvation mm. uh, and, and the absolute emptiness uh, of uh, any um, existing things. Mm. Um, and the universal salvation gives it a sort of power to transform. That's why the Mahayana teaching is particularly attractive to China. Uh, because the Chinese society, even before the arrival of Buddhism, is dominated by uh, sort of uh, educated class uh, who control political, cultural discourse uh, and powers. So their acceptance and their participation in these religious ideas and movements uh, matter a great deal. Uh, so the great vehicle, the universal salvation, allowed them to participate fully in this religious act. And uh, for recruiting and to, new believers. Exactly, to put them on at, at the par with uh, the religious uh, class, mm -hmm. uh, the clergies, um, which makes Chinese Buddhism a quite unique place. And, and this site in particular uh, displays fully uh, this kind of characteristics. Mm -hmm. And the first scene uh, here we see here uh, also is uh, another 
uh, gives us another unique perspective of Chinese Buddhism, that is the arrival of Mahayana teaching, uh, the arrival of uh, Indian Buddhist thoughts has to be transformed into Chinese ones. Mm -hmm. And the one way to do that is to localize these beliefs. Mm -hmm. So um, f for many centuries, uh, in different regions in China, local cults uh, have been developed. Mm. Uh, usually a local adept of Buddhist mm. uh, beliefs uh, display miracle acts uh, and gain the followers. Mm. And later he became uh, such a, a cultic figure um, and, and received uh, uh, society's endorsement. So he became sort of ultimate deities. Mm. Um, give him the same status as Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, those super deities in regular mm. Buddhist uh, sort of pantheon. Uh, and this particular case uh, is a one person uh, whose image appear on top of this large sort of uh, uh, pictorial representation. This whole uh, representation uh, is dedicated to this single person uh, on top uh, with this golden f the sort of uh, glazed face. Mm. Um, his appearance, uh, he looked exactly like a, a Southern Song gentry, mm. uh, which is absolutely not the same uh, as uh, a regular image of Buddha. Mm -hmm. But he's referred as uh, an incarnation of, body, uh, of Shakyamuni Buddha, the okay. founder of Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And his name is Liu Benzun. Liu Benzun. Uh, so Benzun means uh, a, a true incarnation, something like that. Mm. And a Liu is the surname. So he is a lay person. Mm -hmm. uh, who live in 9th century in the Tang Dynasty. Mm. And he, uh, somehow he is initiated through uh, this sort of esoteric Buddhist rituals. Esoteric Buddhism is slightly different from Mahayana, which emphasizes on uh, the ritual performance and the miracle acts mm. uh, of an individual through secret kind of initiation. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually the power of Buddhist belief is displayed through this sort of acts. Um, and Liu Benzun uh, is believed to be a person that follow that kind of tradition. I see two, two questions here. Yes. One, so Liu Benzun was in the 9th century during the Tang Dynasty, yes. but he is memorialized here from exactly. the 12th century. Yes. So this local cult had already been popularized and continued for over three centuries before this was built. Absolutely, actually okay. even longer. Even longer. So it continued to a uh, much later time. Uh, and you can see that on top of this, uh, on the, the, the upper levels of this uh, whole display, uh, uh, you have um, in-carved uh, scriptures, um, which records the 10 acts mm. of Liu Benzun, which makes him uh, basically immortalized. Mm. Um, so he acted on self-mortification, cutting his ear, cutting his nose, but display that he can survive all these acts. Ah. Shows so the his first is starting here. And exactly. Upper left. Yes. One, two, three, uh, all the way to yes, yes. Goes one, three, one, five, three. <laughs> seven, nine, and ah. the other one is I think the uh, the two. Uh, oh, two is up four, there in the far yes, corner, six facing and me. Eight. Yes. So okay. the, this whole thing uh, basically is a pictorial display of uh, his acts. Mm. And then the next, the, the middle level, uh, is, a, is a manifestation of main esoteric Buddhist deities. Mm. So that's why they have, all f they have this sort of fierce looking. Mm -hmm. These are warrior looking, um, but with multi um, arms and, and hands and heads, and heads. Yeah, which is a manifestation of esoteric belief. Uh, but the interesting thing is at the bottom, you actually see the image of Taoist um, uh, uh, images, hmm. uh, which is very unusual, yeah. uh, they appear in the Buddhist site, uh, which is actually a main feature hmm. of religious belief in Sichuan. Hmm. It's very eclectic, uh, it's very sort of synchronized. Hmm. Um, so the whole thing will tell the visitor when they come here that, you know, this is the one that basically dominate the whole site. Mm. Uh, his acts and his ideas uh, really embodied uh, the local Buddhist belief. Mm. But in the meantime, we embrace all other religions as well. Mm. Um, so we've I, mentioned that we have Mahayana Buddhism represented here. We have um, 
the esoteric Buddhism represented in the second level there. Uh, and then how about give our students just a brief mention, the third, or perhaps maybe the earliest form of Buddhism, Theravadas of Buddhism. Yes. Uh, what's, what's some of the differences there, and where is that most commonly practiced? Yeah, the, the, when the Buddhism started, uh, it, it is uh, basically a, a simple set of ideas initiated by uh, Shakyamuni, the founder. Um, and then after his nirvana, uh, which means his death uh, mm -hmm. in, in, in secular term, mm -hmm. but the nirvana is the, is the end of life, mm -hmm. uh, he is transformed into Buddha, mm -hmm. uh, into a ultimate enlightened one, mm -hmm. who is completely uh, um, uh, cut off from the uh, mundane desires. Mm -hmm. uh, and his followers started to build a church. Um, even during his lifetime, uh, basically the Buddhist monastic um, order has started. But the earlier monastery, uh, earlier clergy, uh, they focus on uh, salvation of individuals, hmm. um, which makes them different from the later Mahayana development, which hmm. emphasizes on universal salvation. Hmm. In Mahayana, the most uh, distinctive feature is the invention of a deity called the Bodhisattva. Bodhisattva. Yeah. Bodhisattva is a kind of super being, uh, is genderless super being, who has the same kind of uh, 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 level of wisdom and uh, 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 emancipation uh, as Buddha. But they refuse to enter the state of Nirvana, which is the highest state of uh, emancipation compassion for the suffering. For the compassion, the exactly. They so stay behind. To help basically, us. yes. To yeah. Before everyone else is saved, mm -hmm. they won't enter that uh, stage. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that makes them the, 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 object, the, the, the subject of worship. Mm -hmm. So Theravada Buddhist practice is very much focused on aestheticism, on meditation, yes. on re. re retiring from daily life into mo into monastic life. Absolutely. And it's still popular in Southeast Asia? Still popular in Southeast Asia okay. and still popular in some other areas as well. Okay. Yeah, but the, the most part of East Asia now is dominated Mahayana. Uh, from Tibet to uh, Chinese mainland, mm -hmm. uh, to Japan, to Korea, all dominated by Mahayana. Okay. And esoteric Buddhism has been the constant feature mm. uh, of uh, the area where Mahayana Buddhism uh, really prevailed. I see. I noticed, Professor Lu, up here in the middle, there is some I, dark... I think we should probably... Oh, oh. Okay, Professor Lu, you've mentioned that the first uh, cave we were looking at was sort of an overall introduction. And now this cave behind us is going to start with the first of the main themes. So what is the overall theme of this second cave we'll be talking about today? Yeah, this theme, uh, this whole cave contains uh, some of the most popular themes uh, at the time. Uh, which associated with uh, secular sort of the reason why sec secular society must follow Buddhist teaching. Mm. Uh, and the first one is the most crucial. Um, it, the, it, people when enter this whole site, they, when they look at this, this is the first warning sign. Mm. Uh, a warning sign which tells them if they don't follow Buddhist teachings, if they violate some of the uh, cardinal beliefs of mm. Buddhism, uh, their life their future will be ended in hell. Okay. So this whole belief of purgatory, uh, mm. the hell, underworld, mm. uh, is a greatest, one of the greatest Buddhist contribution to Chinese culture. Mm. Uh, before the arrival of Buddhism, Chinese society also had some kind of ideas about underground, mm. of uh, afterlife. Mm -hmm. But the arrival of Buddhism completely transformed that, uh, injected the Buddhist ideas, mm. and created a very dominant idea of hell. Uh, hell is not just one level, but 18 levels. 18 and levels. one is worse than the other. Mm. So depending on your um, uh, behavior in your previous life, uh, you will be judged after your death uh, mm. by the overlord of the underworld. Uh, so is level one the lightest the, the level? Level one is the lightest, level level exactly. The Le yes, 18 okay. is the worst. Okay. 18 is, you can imagine whatever, you know, however uh, cruel, uh, thing that you can imagine that it will appear in the 18th story of, uh, of hell. I see. Uh, and this whole display is a vivid sort of pictorial illustration of uh, the, the idea of hell okay. uh, and the, um, uh, the specific sort of um, uh, deeds misdeeds we should call mm. uh, associated with uh, a specific level of hell. 
sort of a warning. If exactly. you make this mistake in life, you will end up in this portion yes. of the Buddhist hell. Yes. So you can imagine it when people walk into this, when, we, when they look at them and then they remind themselves, this is really the worst. If they can act better, their life will be improved from now on. So uh, it's, a, it's a kind of interesting design. Uh, but this whole uh, theme uh, is divided into three levels, three levels. as the previous Liu Ben Zun one. Mm, okay. uh, on top, you have uh, a, a very impressive image in the middle mm. uh, with this crown, uh, 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 jeweled crown uh, on, on top of the head. Okay. Uh, this is the image of uh, a bodhisattva overlooking the underworld. Mm. And standing, sitting next to him are the ten kings, mm. the ten lords. Uh, they're responsible for various levels of underworld mm -hmm. and they will make a judgment on people uh, after their death. Mm -hmm. So they will give basically sentence uh, if you committed a serious crime and one of them will sentence them to a certain level. So, mm -hmm. they, so they all appear like Chinese officials. Mm -hmm. That's all Chinese, um, yeah, Chinese officials, which mm -hmm. is another feature of Chinese Buddhism is mm -hmm. uh, bureaucratized uh, religious ideas. Mm -hmm. um, Chinese religion seemed to be influenced by imperial Chinese idea of bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. So everything is uh, um, designed as a part of the bureaucracy. Of course, this is celestial bureaucracy. This is sure. not a um, uh, sort of um, this regular is part of bureaucracy. The localization of uh, exactly. Buddhist concepts into pre existing Chinese culture. Yes, uh, this occurred a long time ago, long time, long before this time. Sure. But it continued to be followed. Uh, to this day. I also wonder if it's a, a, an important way for um, reinforcing the ruling power of the Chinese imperial bureaucratic state if the if the underworld and if the gods are thought to uh, have the same kinds of bureaucratic offices as those who are ruling the world. Uh, you certainly have a good point. Uh, this should be the case. At least this is one of the biggest motivations. So how, when people envision a kind of uh, administrative world that um, mm -hmm governed by uh, Buddhist deities, then the model that they, they use is the Chinese bureaucracy, imperial bureaucracy. Sure. Uh, so you can see the close connections between the two. Mm -hmm. um, and the middle level, uh, starting with the, uh, the themes of hell, the 18 stories of hell. Um, and so you can see all the tortures um, uh, carved into the rock. Uh, at the bottom level, uh, it, it's a more sort of detailed display of um, the, the most um, hideous acts mm. commissioned by, by man uh, during the daily lives uh, and then the um, uh, corresponding punishment they will receive um, uh, in the underworld, in the purgatory, in the, in the, um, uh, in the Buddhist hell. Um, and each of these images, uh, the set of images, uh, is accompanied by a very detailed written explanation mm. uh, carved into rock. So this more read like a comic book, but mm -hmm. the comic book <laughs> basically was a very serious um, uh, uh, themes and, 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 uh, uh, and ideas. And some of these uh, tortures and scenes are quite, bu quite brutal and yes. quite fantastical. Yes, but on the other hand, it's a combination of sort of a realistic depiction of daily lives. Mm. Uh, that's why uh, these kind of massive um, uh, carving, uh, sculptural uh, display uh, can make people feel real. Mm -hmm. um, all the images, uh, men, women, uh, sometimes even uh, children, uh, they all look very real, like a Southern Song people, mm -hmm. uh, like the people who live next door. Mm -hmm. um, and so give them a sense of urgency uh, that they have to do something to change their lives, to improve their lives by following Buddhist teaching. Mm. Images are very immediate. Yes. Okay, so Professor Liu, we've just looked at images of the Buddhist hells, the, pun the bad things you do in your life and the way you'll be punished for it. Now we're back to an image of Shakyamuni, the original Buddha. So how about you tell us what we're going to see here? Yeah, this is another um, example of localization of Buddhism in China. Mm. Uh, they not only uh, develop a local cult associated with Buddhism, ideas that uh, more related to uh, the daily concerns in Chinese society. Uh, they also, uh, the, the Chinese believers, they also transform uh, some of the most fundamental uh, images and deities in Buddhist ideas, uh, Buddhist world, into a cynicized form. Mm -hmm. 
and this is the case, one of the cases, Shakyamuni, the original Buddha. Uh, there's apocrypha associated with him, produced uh, in ancient China, um, basically telling us about his early uh, behaviors, deeds, uh, the miracle deeds or the earlier deeds as a filial son. Um, so the whole uh, this theme uh, is basically is produced the surrounding the central image of Shakyamuni Buddha uh, and give sort of pictorial uh, representation of um, his early lives mm -hmm. as a child, as a, a, a young man with a uh, dedication to um, uh, searching for the ultimate truth mm -hmm. uh, and also uh, his debate with uh, ancient philosophers, uh, sort of heretics um, in, in Buddhist the term. Buddhist uh, yeah. Basically these are the ancient philosophers of different schools. Mm -hmm. So some of these uh, you see the depiction of sort of foreign looking men. Mm -hmm. uh, these supposed to be the ancient sort of heretics mm -hmm. uh, who are defeated by Buddha uh, mm -hmm. after he uh, become enlightened. Mm. Uh, so he refuted their ideas uh, as a way to, uh, uh, to um, uh, show his superiority. So some of the images that we see here of the young Buddha as a child being a perfect example of a filial son, you said that these, these stories, these legends were created in ancient, in China after Buddhism had arrived, or were they already part of the Buddhist tradition of Shakyamuni being a filial son before the concepts of and the religion arrived in China? Um, most of them actually are locally invented. Locally invented. They have been okay. developed in China after mm. the arrival of Buddhism. Mm. Uh, but of course it took a, a, a long time mm. uh, before some of these sort of ideas and these texts emerged. Mm. Uh, they, they appear like original Buddhist texts, mm. but they are locally made. Uh, and, and they became very popular because they provided the ultimate model uh, who can be a better spokesperson uh, to some of the fundamental Chinese moral values mm -hmm. than uh, the founder of the teaching. And so make it very powerful. And you can notice, you will notice that uh, beneath this Buddhist, uh, Buddha's image, you have this uh, carved text, which is a dedicational text by uh, the second emperor of the Song Dynasty mm. uh, to this particular sort of image. Um, it shows the significance of this particular image. Let me see. How about yeah, That's important. But that is the biggest challenge. But yeah. they, but also uh, it is basically a, a, a big success for them that to the, the notion that following Buddha and following his teaching is a is a greater filial piety because that will ensure the rebirth of your parents in in paradise. Okay. Uh, and the, the center of, the central theme of this sort of period. Okay, so Professor Lu, we just saw images of the importance of filial piety even in the life of Shakyamuni Buddha. Now what are we seeing here in this next uh, illustration? Uh, this is another uh, example of uh, uh, sinicization uh, of uh, Indian Buddhism uh, is to turn the theme of filial piety into a essential Buddhist uh, sort of belief. Um, that is uh, one of the most interesting uh, thing happening uh, in the history of Chinese religion, uh, because the the, the difficult uh, difficulty, the biggest challenge uh, for Buddhism to get its message across in Chinese society, is to overcome the notion of filial piety because Buddhism is supposed to renounce your family ties, uh, to completely cut off from the mundane world, uh, to renounce your desires. Uh, but Chinese society, dominated by the notion of filial piety, patriarchal uh, sort of ideas of kingship, um, and you want people to believe you, then you have to convince them why filial piety still matter in this whole Buddhist system. Mm. Or, in, the, in other words, why a uh, Buddhist system can give you better uh, sort of tools mm. to become filial. Uh, and this whole display is about parental love mm. and the children's dedication to their parents. Uh, and all used in Buddhist terms. Uh, and the central theme of the whole display is the notion that um, the women can come here to pray uh, to this sort of of uh, these subjects, these uh, deities, uh, in order to get pregnant.
for fertility. To so carry fertility, on the family exactly. Line, so the ultimate it, version of filial that's right. piety. So the, it's a combination of filial piety mm. and the Chinese sort of interest in having uh, offsprings, uh, mm. of course, male offsprings in this case, um, and by com combining the two. Um, this idea of Buddhism seemed to be even more powerful uh, than the Confucian sort of Confucianist ideas of filial piety, because the Buddhist belief will ensure your parents, after their death, uh, will not be reborn in in the hell, rather in, in paradise. So children's dedication uh, will help their parents. Okay, so Professor Lu, here we are in one of the central halls of this fascinating and beautiful. Uh, cave complex, and this is an absolutely amazing piece of Song Dynasty uh, Buddhist art. So we're looking at um, the Bodhisattva Guanyin. How about you tell us a little bit about her? Because she, the Bodhisattva Guanyin, and I use the the female pronoun. I think you can tell us a little bit about that. But Guanyin is, I think, arguably the most influential and widely known Bodhisattva in East Asia. Absolutely, uh, Guanyin has been. Uh, remain to be the most popular uh, Buddhist deities uh, among all. Um, of course, uh, now we tend to think um, her, her, the, the Bodhisattva's gender is a female, uh, but in fact, uh, Guan Yin remained to be male or female uh, throughout history, and her popularity extends uh, since the ancient time to modern days uh, from Central Asia uh, once upon a time to uh, eat the entire East Asia and to many other regions. Um, the reason for her to be popular in China is, uh, th is the belief that she will, give, uh, she will come to rescue people when they are in need. Mm -hmm. uh, and she is the most compassionate one. Uh, in Chinese society, her gender is transformed slowly from uh, earlier sort of male form to uh, ultimately a female form. Uh, this roughly happened uh, during the Song dynasties. Mm. And I think the transformation itself uh, is not just because uh, Guan Yin is associated with the notion of compassion, but also um, she is increasingly becoming uh, the, the deity, the goddess uh, for women uh, to uh, receive fertilities. Mm. So she is uh, somehow is very similar uh, in, in her later functions as Queen Mar uh, Mary mm. uh, in the Christian tradition. Um, but she is more than that, of course, uh, because she is also a bodhisattva, embodied the idea of emptiness. Mm. Uh, and this most impressive sort of uh, thousand hand Guan Yin, uh, the Guan Yin with uh, 1,007 hands, uh, each of which uh, hold a, 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 a religious sort of uh, tool, uh, uh, tool mm. object uh, that's supposed to contain miracle power. Mm. Um, and this manifestation of Guan Yin is uh, one of the most popular forms of, uh, of, sort of uh, iconographical image of Guan Yin. So she no longer appear as a sort of a regular bodhisattva, ra rather a bodhisattva with enormous miracle powers. Um, but this particular image um, was dated to the Southern Song, the time when this whole cave was made. But over the centuries, uh, this whole image deteriorated uh, and it deteriorated to such a degree that it requires extensive restoration. Mm -hmm. But since this is a, a, a treasure of, of the whole site, uh, it, it requires a very meticulous kind of research and work. So it's a joint effort by several institutions in China, universities and uh, cultural institutions, uh, and they work together for three years. First, they study the whole image and then they carefully um, try to restore to its original look mm -hmm. uh, and with modern materials. And this restoration process was fairly controversial. Uh, exactly. Um, why? And I'm curious what you think as a historian of ancient medieval China, what you think about the, the necessity or perhaps the uh, dangers of restoration? There's no question that this image requires extensive restoration. Mm. Uh, the question is how uh, and uh, uh, to um, what to what end you want to um, um, uh, create uh, sort of, um, or restore this image. Um, to be honest, um, I, I have seen the original, the earlier sort of deteriorated state, but it does have a sort of a, a sense of beauty because of time. 
but nevertheless, uh, it's a deteriorated state. It's a sort of distorted appearance, uh, no matter how sort of um, interesting it, uh, it looks like. Um, so when it first to get restored, when people see the actual result of restorations, um, there's certain controversy um, uh, in society because people think that it looks slightly quite different from the original look. Um, and uh, earlier I have the same concern, but later when I came here, when I read the report, when I went to uh, the museums of this cave, uh, they have a very detailed explanation of the whole process. Uh, it, it, I'm, I'm fully convinced. I think the result is actually uh, very scientifically done uh, and also very sensible. Uh, it does appear to be sort of more sort of um, uh, refreshing or new, uh, but that's a result of uh, restoration, not because they altered anything. Well, I look forward to seeing some of the pre-restoration images of this. Having never been here before, what I see now is dramatic and incredibly impressive and, and shockingly beautiful. Yeah, it is. Um, and I think this is a, a, one of the most uh, sort of common struggles in nowadays in China, um, uh, the struggle between cultural restoration and the preservation. Sure. Um, I think this is the constant theme around the world nowadays. Yeah. But one thing uh, that is clear is uh, the Chinese um, uh, art historians, um, cultural preservationists uh, and also the, the government become more sensible uh, in preserving uh, its ancient uh, sort of cultural relics. I think we're all glad for that. Yes. This is the end of Shakyamuni. So earlier we see the, his earlier life. So this is the end. So they, they mix the, uh, sort of mixed it with other themes, the life of Buddha. And that's the, I think that's the ending part of his journey. And then we start from, yeah, of Buddha. And then after this Guan Yin thing, we move to um, the Celestial Buddha. Okay. It's another world. But we're going to come to an end very soon. Okay. Has this been uh, refurbished? This is... Uh, no, I think this is pretty much the original look. The, the, the Nirvana scene. Okay, so Professor Liu, uh, now we're here looking at two beautiful sculptures, one about the birth of the Buddha Shakyamuni and one about the end of Shakyamuni's life. So how about you tell us what we're seeing here, first with the, the birth of the Buddha. Yeah, the, the legend of the birth of Buddha, which becomes popular in China, uh, is the nine dragons were, when, when he was born, uh, the nine dragons appeared uh, and, and pulled water over him, over him as a child. Uh, so that theme uh, here is, is uh, displayed in a very uh, interesting sort of um, uh, Chinese style culture, uh, mm. sculpture. Um, but, and the next one is the Nirvana. So he's the starting of his life mm. uh, in miracle and the end of his life also in miracle. Uh, that is the uh, theme of Nirvana, mm. uh, which means Buddha entered the stage of uh, uh, extinction. Um, it becomes the true Buddha. Uh, afterwards. Yeah. He's extinguished from this world and yes. from the cycle of yes. birth and rebirth and yes. samsara. Yes, and, and I think the arrangement is also deliberate because mm -hmm. uh, this whole so-called Buddhist theme park mixed with the belief of local cults, mm -hmm. the main themes of Buddhist doctrines, and then the life of Buddha. Mm. So here, once you enter the stage of Nirvana, uh, that's the end of historic Buddha. Mm. And then this cave continued to, uh, to move forward uh, to celestial level, to mm. celestial Buddhas. Uh, because doctrines of Mahayana teaching emphasize the, uh, the infinite number of Buddhas mm -hmm. presiding over infinite number of universe. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a, a very grand kind of vision uh, of, uh, of the universe. Um, and so we're moving from this stage to the next. Okay, Professor Lu, so we're at the final of the stops in the caves that we'll be looking at today. So what is this magnificent you know, bisected or, you know, wheel with lines coming out of it that we're looking at. Um, this is basically a visualization of um, the future path of any sentient beings after uh, the current life. Uh, basically, the sixth path of rebirth, okay. depending on your previous deeds. Remember, when we enter this cave, 
it started with the, a warning sign, mm. uh, the punishment in the hell, mm -hmm. uh, which warned people that if they don't follow the teaching, uh, they will end it up. Or if they even uh, not just don't follow the teaching, they, if they violate it, mm. uh, the, the, the most important sort of Buddhist uh, uh, ethics, uh, they will be punished in hell. Mm -hmm. But And this cave now come to an end. It ended with this uh, will that displaying uh, the sixth path of rebirth. Mm. Um, you can be reborn as a god, mm. as a celestial being, or as a human, uh, which is pretty normal. Mm. And then, uh, but if you do uh, uh, committed really serious crimes, and then you will be reborn as hungry ghosts, that's the worst, mm -hmm. uh, and a beast. So there are six different um, paths. Mm. Uh, basically tell people that uh, it's up to them to choose uh, the future of their life. You see. Um, and so they better behave themselves. This um, connects to the important Buddhist yes. concept of karma. Yes, and not just, you are absolutely right. All these are determined by actions, which is in Sanskrit uh, the word karma. Mm. All the actions that you have done in your current life or in previous life will determine the outcome of your next life. Mm -hmm. But all these are in the cycle of birth and rebirth, which means even when you are reborn as celestial god, uh, it still doesn't mean that you are, uh, you are free from all the desires and illusions mm -hmm. and the sufferings. Mm -hmm. uh, it only means that you have slightly better life. Mm -hmm. uh, so if the celestial god, the deities, in other sort of uh, religious uh, context, uh, may signify uh, a complete sort of um, uh, liberations, but not in Buddhism. In mm. Buddhism, only the enlightened ones, uh, bodhisattvas um, and Buddhas, those are the ones who can uh, completely uh, get away from sufferings. But all the rest, they are still in these endless cycles. Mm. So this will is a display not only about uh, the different choices, different outcomes, but also uh, about the, um, the ultimate sort of message of Buddhism, that is, uh, you are part of this world. Uh, it's a world of sufferings. You better get away from it.